All right, for those of you who can see me and those who are logged on, what questions you got for me today? Let's see if anybody's actually logged on, actually. Let's see. Elijah, how's it going? Yeah, I think I cut it down to about a 10 or 15 second lag on the video. So I've got any requests. Oh, hold on. So I've got a request to do the pH and the pOH from pKB and KB, which is one of the first, that's the number one question on that web assign homework. So I brought the, brought the web assign so you can see what it is. Um, question is, if you're given a 0.2 molar solution of ammonia and a 0.0149 molar solution of ammonium chloride with a pKB of 4.74, what's the pOH and what's the pH? So let's work that problem. It's actually pretty straightforward. So it gives you the reaction, NH3 plus H2O goes back and forth to NH4 plus and OH minus. And we're given concentration of ammonia is 0.2 molar. The concentration of ammonium in H4 plus 0.0149. Now, you're given ammonium chloride. We're going to get rid of the chlorine. It's just a spectator ion because we can't buy ammonium off the shelf. To approach any of these problems, particularly with the basis buffers, you can do it the same way you did it with the acidic. You've got your equilibrium constant, in this case, Kb. 
we're given the pKb equals 4.74. Our Kb in this case is going to be 10 to the minus 4.74. Kb is going to equal Q. In this case, Q is the concentration of NH4+, plus, concentration of OH- minus, over the concentration of NH3. So we've got a reaction. We've got our expression for Q. We've got Q equals KQ. The only thing that remains here is our IC table. Now for me, I prefer to set these tables up with either the H plus or the OH minus in the center column because the changes are always the same for these. Ammonia is 0 0.2 molar. Ammonium is 0 0.0149 molar. So our N value, 0.2 minus X, 0 0.0149 plus X. We're not given equilibrium values, but we are asked to find the pH and the POH. POH is just the negative log of the concentration of OH minus. So all we got to do is find the concentration of OH minus and then we can find the POH. Once we know the POH, we just subtract that from 14 and that'll give us our pH. To find our concentration of OH minus, insert the values here we have from the E row, so it's X times 0 0.0149 plus x all over 0 0.2 minus x. Use the quadratic formula, solve for x. You're only going to take the positive root because in this case the OH minus concentration is equal to x, so there's only one solution to this problem. And that's how you solve part one, uh, problem one. Now, I shared this, if you go back in the video, you'll actually be able to see it. I've already got the answers up, so if you're curious, when you work it out, the POH should be 3.6. That makes the pH 11, 10.4. All right. Now, Camille has asked about, can I go over how to find the mass of a buffer solution, like the question from the buffer homework on WebAssign. So I'm going to bring up that homework assignment really quick. Assuming I can find it. So this is a question she's asking about. What mass of HF hydrofluoric acid needs to be added to make a 0.908 liter solution that has a pH of 2.02 .02 if the pKa of HF is 3.18? So bring it back up to so you can see my webcam. Now, these types of problems are actually mathematically very easy to solve. The challenge here is coming up with the concept to solve it. But again, i kind of given you the framework. These are all equilibrium problems, and since they're equilibrium problems, there's three things you're, three things you're going to need. Your K and Q, your Q, and your IC table. So in this case, we've got hydrofluoric acid going back and forth to H plus and F minus. And I've got the pKa of HF is 3.18. And I want my pH to be 2.02. .02. So, got HF, H plus, and F minus. 
Initial value of H plus is always going to be zero. We assume that water is not going to contribute anything meaningful. Plus X, plus X, minus X, minus X. We're not told there's any fluoride in the solution, so we're going to assume it's zero. We always need a starting concentration of acid, though. So that's what it's actually asking this problem is, what's the concentration need to be? And then from there, you're going to backtrack out the mass. So this is an unknown variable here. So let's just give it some variable big A. So we, we have some starting concentration A, which means our final concentration is just A minus X. Concentration of fluoride here is X. The pH is going to give us this information. So if the pH is 2.02, .02, that tells us our equilibrium concentration of H plus is just 10 to the minus 2.02. .02. So in this case, X equals 10 to the minus 2.02. .02. So we've got K equals Q, Q equals H plus times F minus all over HF. We are much better to stick with using symbolic logic for this, and you'll see why in just a minute. Fluorine B plus X. Yes, you are correct. It should be plus, plus X there. Sorry about that. So we stick it in. We get X times X all over A minus X. We can rearrange now. And when we do rearrange, we get X squared plus X times KA all over KA equals the starting concentration of HF. So we got X here. It's in the negative... 2.2. We've got the pK is 3.18, so the kA here is 2 to the minus 3.18. You will solve this to get a concentration. Solve this to go for, get a concentration. Now the other information the problem gives you. Our volume of solution here is 0 0.908 liters. So once we know the starting concentration, this will be its molarity. The concentration times 0.908 liters will give us the moles of HF. So then to find our mass of mol HF, it's just our moles of HF times the molecular weight. So really the hardest part of this problem is this connection here. You don't know what the starting concentration is, so you have to solve for it. From that starting concentration, and given the volume, you're going to backtrack out the moles, and from the moles, that's where you'll get the mass. So Abby's asked, can we go over the questions similar to the discussion board? And as far as the tests, they're going to be very similar to the packets of the homework. So if you can do those problems just fine without your notes, you'll be set for the test. Honestly, test four is usually the easiest test you'll take the whole semester because this is as hard as the ice tables gets. So let's look at what the discussion board was this week. I'll show it to you on my end. So the discussion board for today, given the following reaction and concentration, so you have acetic acid, HC2H3O2, going back and forth to H plus and C2H3O2 minus. You want to determine the pH and the pOH to two decimal points. And you're given that it's 0.1 molar acetic acid and that your pK of acetic acid is 4.78. So let's bring you back. So acetic acid in this case is H C two H three O two A Q. 
goes back and forth to H plus, AQ, plus C2, H3, O2, minus 1, AQ. You're given it's a 0.1 molar H, C2, H3, O2 solution with a pKa of 4.78. Now, there was a lot of intentionality behind this problem. A lot of students, when they learn the henderson hasselbalch equation, they tend to become very dependent on it because it's a super fast, easy way to solve problems. And just in case you forgot, the henderson hasselbalch here is pH equals pKa plus the log concentration of the conjugate base of the concentration of the parent acid. Here's the thing, I didn't give you any conjugate base. And so since the concentration of A minus here is zero, this becomes an infinitely large value. You can't use this equation more. So this is gonna force you to actually work through the IC tables. henderson hasselbalch is okay to use if you have a buffer mixture. And again, the assumption here is your concentration of the conjugate base and the acid are greater than the extent of reaction. This will be true if your pKa is very large, meaning that you have a weak acid, or that these concentrations are actually usually greater than 0.1 molar. But anyway, to solve this particular problem, again, we're just gonna solve it like any equilibrium problem. We've got KQ equals Q. Q in this case is H plus. C2, H3, O2 minus one, all over H, C2, H3, O2. IC table. Given the initial concentration of 0.1, concentration of H plus is zero. Same thing's true of the acetate. Minus x, plus x, plus x. So we have 0.1 minus x, x, and x. If we plug this back into our expression, we get this equals x squared all over 0.1 minus x. We're being asked to find the pH. The pH is going to come from this square. So the pH is just the negative log of the concentration of H plus. So you know, we're just going to kind of use a Blair diagram here to backtrack it out. So this was meant to be a pretty easy problem to solve. We solve for x squared, or we solve for x, x squared times kax minus 0 0.1 times k equals 0. You will get a value for x solving this. Again, acid base are the easy equilibrium problems, meaning that we're always going to take the same positive root. Once you get the root, you're going to stick in here for your concentration of H plus and backtrack out the pH. And that's pretty much how all these types of problems are solved generally. Like the only hard part is the periphery questions. So you have to find starting concentrations to find starting masses. And you need pH and pOH, which are just additional steps on top of doing these types of calculations. So Abby's asked, as long as we understand how to basically solve an equilibrium problem with the IC tables and the Q, yeah, that's basically how all these problems are approached. Again, there's some shortcuts like henderson hasselbalch I don't encourage you to use them because there are a lot of assumptions built into them. But yeah, if you understand that, you pretty much understand 90% of the steps to solving these problems. You're always going to go through an IC table somehow, some way. The IC table is going to give you an algebraic expression to solve for the unknown variable you need to find whatever you're being asked to find. And again, if it's for like a starting mass, like how much mass do you need to get a, get a given pH, you're going to use the IC table to tweeze out one of the initial columns through this expression between K and Q. If you're asked to find the pH or the pOH, you're going to tweeze it out by finding out H plus or OH minus in the bottom squares. 
if you're being asked to find the Ka, you're going to be given concentrations and you're just basically plugging them back in the expressions for Q to find Ka. What was adorable there, Abby? You hear my cat in the background? So I agree with Elijah, cat people rock. So my cat, I'll bring the video over to her really quick. So Squeaky's a little codependent. She got very upset when I closed the door to start making this recording. Because of that, come here. She decided she needed to barge in. Which is weird because she spent the past two hours sitting in her perch, ignoring me. But I guess she didn't want anything to do with me until she thought someone else was getting my attention. Now her name is Squeaky. The reason she has that name is because she doesn't actually have a meow. So you probably heard the sound she was trying to make, but that's generally the best she can muster in terms of a meow. This will sadly probably be the part of the video you all remember the most. Wish you're honest about that part. So question just got asked about the formal lab reports. Yeah, they're going to follow the exact same rubric. I'm going to grade a bit more aggressively with these labs because you can, you already have gotten feedback from me in terms of what mistakes you've made. Um, again, kind of weigh your choices. I mean, when I say I grade harder, the things I didn't take off points for before, but I comment on, those are going to get points taken off of them now. I've most, if you just want the grade you had before, just submit something in the assignment that says, I just want my old grade and save yourself the trouble. But if you do want to get a better grade, Again, I still offer the revisions, so we're getting kind of close to that deadline, but if you send me something, I might be able to get to it tomorrow. I mean, Abby, I think 
no one else really has a question, so whatever questions you've got, feel free to ask them. This tends to be kind of the wind down part of the semester for my course. I really try to get everything out, particularly with Chem 2 because of how I can set it up. I try to get out all the really aggressive stuff before the withdrawal date. So the next big hurdle you would have would be the lab practical and the final exam. So the test next week will open up on Monday at 12.30 p.m. It will be available for one full week so the following Monday at 12.30 p.m., at which point you cannot take the exam after 12.30. So you have to start, if you're going to wait until Monday after next to start, you have to take it at 12.29 p.m., but you've got the whole week to take it. Same format as the last test. You've got 10 multiple choice. I think you've got four free responses in this case. You're going to have a second link to submit your work. You're going to have unlimited submissions for the second one or for the work link, but as far as the test itself, you get the hour and 15 minutes and it will auto submit for you when you're done. There's a lot going on in the discussion thread right now. Um, so Camille, I'm going to have, um, just keep in mind it's telling you for two decimal points. Or no, it tells you for one decimal point for the pHs, so just make sure you're getting the 3.5 if that's what you're entering. If not, shoot me an email and we can go back and forth in terms of an actual email so you can show me your work. As for the lab practical, it's going to consist of basically questions that are connected to the concepts that would have been covered in the labs. So there's one about Beer's Law. If you're given absorbance versus concentration, you need to be able to use the Beer's Law curve in order to be able to figure out the concentration of an unknown solution. There's a question that asks you what concept, it's a matching question that asks you the concepts between the labs. So what concept was covered in this lab, what concept was covered in this lab, et cetera. So as we get closer to that lab practical, I will probably just send you out an email the week beforehand telling you specifically what concepts are being tested on the practical. The practical itself, does not take two hours and 50 minutes, but you get two hours and 50 minutes to take it. It is a multiple choice, mixture of multiple choice, free response, matching questions. Again, you've got your lab manual, you've got your lab notebook, and you're gonna use that in order to determine, answer the questions in there. But there are, there shouldn't be any gotcha questions in terms of this lab practical. If you understand basically the techniques and the data analysis, you should be fine for it. Now, in terms of regarding the sig figs on the homeworks, particularly when I ask you for pH and POH, I think I specify in the problems how many decimal points, not sig figs, to use. The reason being is that the log scale, when you go to two decimal points, gets kind of picky, and there's a lot, a range you can get in terms of your answers. The reason why I do the one decimal point is that as long as you are pretty close with your answer in terms of H plus or OH minus, you'll get a pH within 0.1, uh, 0.1 pH units on the pH scale because it is logarithmic, so it's exponential if you go the other way. But in terms of the one we worked, it's just 3.5. We That would be two significant figures. The reason we don't worry about sig figs with this, there are no rules for logarithms. So when it comes to sig figs, you'll generally hear say hear people say, oh, use three sig figs. There is actually a historical reason for this. There's, there's no justification for it. The three sig figs comes from slide rules. So back in my office at Wake Tech, I actually have a slide rule that does logarithms. It can only carry three sig figs of precision, so that's where that rule came from. There are actually proven mathematical rules for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But when it comes to logarithms and exponentials, we don't have anything.
And there is a lengthy explanation as to why we don't have rules for it. Well, if Abby's good for now, then I, I guess we can kind of end today. So Elijah's asking about issues with his calculator and see if there's a way to break it up and get the right answer. You can actually just use the quadratic formula. Um, if you were to take the, we were physically taking the class, I would give you the quadratic formula on the exam. But for the quadratic formula, it's opposite of b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, where a is the term in front of x squared, b is the term in front of x, and c is the term without an x. And you can just manually calculate those numbers and put them in, but this is also why I ask for your work. If you've got it set up to this point and you end up getting x roots, and you probably saw this if you got the wrong answer in the last exam, but I still gave you a whole bunch of points. This is algebra. And I can always assume that this is an issue with the calculator, but if you've gotten to this point, you clearly understand the concept. It's an issue unrelated to the concept I'm testing. So question is, how do we, can we see how to briefly identify an acid and an acid-base reaction? Yep. Acids are the easiest to figure out. And while you shouldn't do process of elimination to figure out who the base is, you know, if it works, it works. 
So in all cases, our acid is going to be the one that loses a proton. So in terms of identifying the acid, just basically one thing we try to do with acids is we try to keep the acidic hydrogen on the front end. So look at your compounds and see who's got hydrogen on the front. Now in this top one we have two that have hydrogen. So once you've identified the ones that had the leading hydrogens, look on the right side and see kind of which compound corresponds to which starting compound. We have a sulfur here. So bisulfite is its corresponding compound. We've got water here. So HGO plus hydronium will be its corresponding compound. So the question is, which of these lost a hydrogen? Well, in this case, we see it goes from H2SO3 to HSO3. So this is our acid. And I mean, process elimination is going to be the easiest, but since water gains a hydrogen, this is going to be your base. Now down here, the tip off that ammonia is not an acid is that it doesn't, having, it doesn't have these leading three H's. Um, it's on the tra tailing end. And the reason it's on the tailing end is that they're not acidic. This is actually a pretty good nomenclature that they're consistent with in the chemical literature. Acidic hydrogens are always placed in front, so we know who's acidic and who's not. So since we don't see the leading hydrogen, it's probably going to be a base, but we need to confirm it. So we've got water, and the only th other thing that looks like water on the other side is the OH. For the NH3, it looks like NH4+. Well, the water had to lose a hydrogen, so that's what makes this the acid. And since this accepted a hydrogen, this ends up becoming the base. Now, the right side are going to be where your conjugates are. So everything that is a product is defined as a conjugate. So if you're saying one of these is the conjugate, you're automatically wrong. I don't even have to look at the prop. Conjugates only appear on the right side. And the conjugates are, what are the opposite of whatever they started as. So if this started as an acid, this is the conjugate base. If this is a base, this is the conjugate acid. Up here, if this is the acid, this is the conjugate base. And up here, if this is the base, this is the conjugate acid. And the reason we call them conjugates is that one, they are what the starting compounds are after they act like an acid and base. But the thing is that if we were to flip this reaction around, so this is reversible, the reverse reaction occurs. Going backwards, H2SO3 minus acts like an acid, acts like a base, it accepts the hydrogen. H2O plus acts like an acid because it loses the hydrogen on the way back. So the conjugate defines it as a product and the acid base defines it as how it acts when the reverse reaction occurs. Now, in terms of the web assigned problems, bring those up. A lot of these are just basic definitions. Well, I guess I can show you, can I? What is a Lewis acid base? What is a Bronsted acid base? What is an Arrhenius acid base? Here it's asking you what are the conjugates. So in terms of solving this type of problem, what is the conjugate acid in this reaction? The conjugates are going to be on the right side. So you've already eliminated half the answers here. You know it's not water and you know it's not H2SO3 because both of these would be an acid or a base, not a conjugate. So we look at how it behaves when it goes backwards. H2SO3, when it goes backwards, forms H2SO3. That's accepting a hydrogen, so that would make it an, a base. So H3O plus, in this case, is our conjugate acid. The other way we would figure that out, we just look at what water started as. Water accepted a hydrogen over here, so that would make it a base. So on the right side, it forms a conjugate acid. And the same thing's true for the rest of these. What's the conjugate? Well, if it's a conjugate, it has to be on the right side, so that tells us it's one of these two, and we just work out who the hydrogen acceptor is. When it asks what's the acid or the base, you're working with the left side of the reaction.
So I guess to kind of summarize for you, if you're being asked to find the acid or the base or the conjugate, if it's conjugate, you're looking at the product side. If it's just acid base, you look on the left side, the reactant side. The acid base definition is going to depend if it's accepting a hydrogen as goes from one side to the other or if it's losing it. If it's accepting a hydrogen, it's a base. If it's losing it, it's an acid. Now, just as a fair warning, the test is Monday, you have a week to take it. I would say go ahead and take it as soon as you can. We're getting ready to go into electrochem and nuclear chemistry. Now, nuclear chemistry, you can teach that to yourself in a day. It's very easy. Redox is hard. And if you've had me for Chem 1, you know redox is hard. Now, that said, if you have me for Chem 1, I tend to over-prepare my students for Chem 2 with redox. We go through balancing full redox reactions, half redox reactions. This is unfortunately a concept I'm not here to teach you in person, but it is definitely a concept we spend a full day just balancing redox reactions, keeping track of what's an oxidation versus reduction reaction. You don't want to have to learn that on top of taking the exam. So Monday when the exam becomes available, take it as soon as you can, preferably before the, third, before the Wednesday, black, uh, Wednesday um, discussion board. The discussion board starts out light, It'll ask you what's being oxidized and what's being reduced in the reaction. You're gonna see with the homework, there are, I think, 10 redox homework problems. They are hard, they are very time consuming. They're much harder than I will give you on the final, but they are still very hard concepts. So budget as much time as you can for learning how to balance a redox reaction. Beyond that, the Nernst equation, um, plating uh, the plating equation, those are all pretty straightforward equations to work with but the hardest one is gonna be balancing those redox reactions. So with the discussion board, actually, if you go back to, so you have the pandemic discussion board web folder. If you look at just that announcement, it actually gives you the PKA and the problem, but I copied and pasted these to each other. So if you click on the link and then try to do it, it's missing the PKA. So just go back up to the root parent discussion board or just Google the PKA of acetic acid. But I didn't notice that until I set the discussion board up and they're really hard to go back through and edit. But that would be a good thing to work on today and fix that.
Yeah, it was something I didn't catch until I set up the discussion boards and went back through and tried to edit getting that PK in, PK in. But it, for some odd reason, the disc, part of the discussion board you see when you first go into that discussion folder versus when you click in the assignment, those aren't the same thing. They're actually different things I had to program in. So if I make a mistake in one, it doesn't necessarily show up in the other one. It's weird. But I've never really had to use discussion boards before. I don't teach. This is the first time I've ever taught an online course. I'm glad I did the online teaching certification program. I think it's helping quite a bit with this. But there's a lot of little weird nuances with discussion boards they definitely did not tell us about. The nice thing is I'm teaching Kim 2 this summer, so I've got your discussion boards that I'm just going to kind of copy and paste into that uh, course. So I'm like a third of the way set up for my summer course now. Yeah, thanks Malika for posting that because I actually, the, I found out, I went back through and watched the old live streams. Their comments actually do show up in real time with the video, so that, that will actually show up for anyone who's, who happens to come across this question. Yeah, it should be interesting, Elijah. They're talking about making this an online course in the fall, online course in the fall as well. So, set up for organic as well. We should be good to go. And then you get to take Organic 2 with me in the spring, and that'll be the first time you and I have actually both done the lab. Yeah, Abby, I'd recommend if you can't get Kay Sandberg for Organic at State, come take come back and take it at Wake Tech with either me or Christina Sacco. Um, I love my alma mater, but they are absolutely atrocious for teaching organic chemistry, and I stand by that statement. Kay Sandberg is amazing, but everyone else, it's really kind of hit or miss. Um, with some of them, it's really hit or miss what type of lecture you're going to get that day. So... At least with Wake Tech, you can get smaller courses. Now, the one advantage State does have over us, you'll actually get to see the equipment that we're going to talk about in class. We can't afford an IR. We can't afford an MR. On the other, other hand, they it's not exactly like they let you use the equipment that much, so you will get to see it. I don't know how much you actually get to use it. But yeah, Abby, shoot me emails to who you're taking, and I can kind of give you a feel for what your course is going to be like. I don't know if Elon Ison is teaching the class. If he is, he at least has the right ethos for teaching the course. So he may not be a fantastic instructor, but he's very student-centric. I mean, also keep in mind on the 152 website, I actually post my 251 notes. So that's actually visible now. You can see on my 251 notes, on my 251 packet. Well, I don't think I show you the packets, but you got the 251 notes and you definitely have my YouTube series. Yeah, I try to look after y'all. I mean, again, and I think I put the disclaimer in that folder. I don't necessarily update those as much as I update my actual courses but at least you have something else to go off of. They're gonna use um, the Cary textbook, which is what we use. Cary is the golden standard for teaching organic chemistry. It is a fantastic textbook. Like I've had to go back and reteach myself organic and I did not appreciate that was why I passed organic one, but it is a very good book. So I do recommend buying it. Um, that said, I do give my students links to free organic textbooks. The problem is they're in different orders, they're written by different people and they aren't necessarily the best textbooks for it. The one thing I'm going to tell you right now to survive organic, you need to buy a modeling kit. Bug me when you're at state. I don't know what state does for their modeling kits anymore, 
I know the one I got while I was there, and it's so hard to find it because the company that sold it wasn't making any money off of it. But it's one of the best modeling kits, and I've actually found links for it that I've sent out to my students. Pol Polymer and Color Chemistry Program is at State. That I'm not familiar with. Is If it's through the College of Textiles, it'll be decent. If it's through the Chemistry Program, it'll again kind of be hit or miss. Um, that said, my industry friends have talked about how the quality of State's College of Textiles program has declined. I don't know if that's still true. But I have heard that the students are getting less and less practical hands-on experience. You may also want to consider double majoring if it's all possible. So do your polymer and color chemistry program and then see if you can major in a more traditional major. So like a straight chemistry degree or a straight textiles degree in the event that you find out the program is not going to quite get you where, quite going to get you where you want to go. Oh, good. So the College of Textiles will probably actually be a fairly well-taught course. So State's College of Textiles and their engineering programs are pretty good programs. Again, you're going to notice a difference going from community college to four-year university. They are much bigger classrooms, and you're definitely going to notice the professors are much more lecture-oriented than they are like hands-on with their students. But they do produce quality programs. Handout of the formal lab should be under the lab resources folder. I think it's the KA lab. Let me check on the course website really quick. But yeah, it should be on Blackboard. So on Blackboard underneath lab resources, you can see an EA and Catalysis lab handout. It's actually in the top of that directory. And that's a copy of the original lab procedures. I have not heard anything about the brain biology program, so that's well outside my scope. So all I just ask is the lab report on the original lab? Yes. So basically, you're just going to take your first lab report, revise it, um, be sure to incorporate my, my corrections, or you have the option of saying, I just want my old grade. So if you don't want to go through updating your lab, your old lab report, you're happy with that grade, just say, I want my old grade, and I'll give you the points for it. Now, fair warning, if you do submit it late, you're still going to get the 30% off. So if Wednesday rolls around and, or even today rolls around, you're like, I'm not going to be able to finish this on time, just say I want my old grade. But if you say, oh, I want my old grade after the due date, you're going to get 30% off your old lab grade.
I did start working on your final exam today. I'm trying to program it into, Black, into Blackboard. It's going to follow the format, very similar format to the exams you've taken so far online. Big difference, these are all going to be multiple choice questions. This is just to save me time in terms of grading. 35 questions, multiple choice. There are partial credits for certain multiple choice answers just because some of them are longer problems. You'll have Monday at midnight, first day of exam, or Monday morning, like at 12.01 a.m., up until Friday at 3 p.m. And the reason I put the 3 p.m. cap on there is that if you started at 2.59 p.m., that means you're going to finish at about 4.50-ish. I had to have my grades in by the following Monday, so I can't give you until midnight on that Friday to do it all. I need you to get your exam done in time. But that's how the final exam is going to work. It's a multiple choice online Blackboard exam. Keep hearing the wind knock around my apartment. I'm worried the power's going to flicker. I'm going to lose the Wi-Fi connection one more time. Just got to make it to 145. So Abby's talked about conservation, um, something she wants to do. Have you considered looking at environmental engineering as well? Or looking at, um, there is a natural resources degree at NC State. If anything to consider is a double major. Natural resources is more um, park services. So if you want to go work for the park service, work as a forestry major. Now that said, I have a friend that did it and it is hard to find work, but once you do get work, it's pretty, you know, you're basically a park ranger. You do a lot of land management, a lot of land conservation. But again, it's one of those that there is kind of a high barrier to entry with it. So Ryan Hoskin has just added, he's just said he missed the first part. Yes, you would take the negative log of the H plus concentration and that would give you the pH. And for those of you who can double major in college, I highly encourage you to double major. It just makes you surprisingly marketable. Um, the traditional fields have kind of like no one's an army of one. And the problem with the traditional fields is they're pretty isolated. I doubled in chemistry and chemical engineering. My PhD is actually in engineering, but that BS in chemistry has served me so well. It has made me much more marketable than my engineering degree ever could. So if you can double major, if it's not a financial burden, it won't hurt your GPA and you can do it in a reasonable period of time, please go double major.
So if you're looking to look in the lab, also consider double majoring in just biology as a field. Um, biology is a saturated field, but at least there are jobs there. And also see if you can get into undergraduate research while you're at NC State. We have undergraduate research at Wake Tech. Obviously, it's not really going on right now. But if you want to go work in a research lab, having prior research experience is a massive plus. There are a lot of students who step into research labs who do not have a clue what they're doing. That just creates a hurdle to training. If you can say, hey, I did research in an undergraduate research lab, you know, you probably don't know squat about safety because I know NC State safety training program, but at least you understand like basic things like how to make a culture, how to pour plates, how to do analysis, how to do assays, things like that. That will make you far more marketable. So do consider undergraduate research if you want to go work in a lab. Now, a few comments on working in labs. There are three tiers of people. People with bachelor's degrees are typically technicians. You're there to maintain the equipment and make sure it's working right. You will probably not be conducting experiments. The master's degree does the most experimental work. They have the least control over the projects. The person with the PhD has the most control over the project. They do almost no experimental work. So those are your three kind of tiers for you. If, you're, if you want a nine to five tech job, your bachelor's degree will get you there just fine. If you want to conduct experiments all day, but you don't get say over how it happens, get your master's degree. If you want to say what we, what we should be doing, but you don't ever want to touch the lab again, get your PhD. Now, fair warning with someone who has a PhD, makes you incredibly unmarketable. So don't get your PhD unless you really need it. So the reason a PhD makes you unmarketable is your PhD is, is traditionally viewed as a specialty. And so someone with a bachelor's degree is considered a jack of all trades, but a master of none. So in principle, they can be trained to do whatever job they need to do in industry. A PhD has already had the training, but their training is very specific to the field of research they do. So because of that, unless they are hiring in your specific field and your specific expertise, it's very hard to find a job. So that's what makes the bachelor so much more marketable is that you have basically no specialty, so they can specialize you. If you have a PhD, you spent six years getting specialized and no one wants to train you to specialize in something else because you've already spent the six years doing it. The other thing is that PhDs do not do, I don't know euphemism for it, grunt work. Basically they, they are, and I got told this when I interviewed with Philip 66, as a PhD, we don't need you in the lab because yeah, you understand the techniques inside and out. That's not where you're needed. You're needed to write grants, you're there to map out research programs. So you're management with a PhD, but typically speaking, management is a much larger, much smaller percentage of a workforce than the people that actually do the work. So it limits you two ways. There's less overall jobs, and two, those jobs are should have to be specialized to your particular background. Now, a master's is not technically halfway between the two. It's more like a third. With the master's degree, you've acquired some advanced specialization. So um, typically, you've taken more math courses, or in the terms of the chemical fields, you've taken courses that have taught you some specialized analytical techniques. That's what makes you more marketable as a master's. Now, again, the master's pool is smaller than the bachelor's pool, but not substantially smaller. You're still not considered management with a master's degree. You're just considered more of an advanced tech. But you're a more marketable tech because you do have more special, you have more skills than someone with just a bachelor's degree. But in terms of years in grad school, a master's is only two years. It's five, typically six to get your PhD. Now, Elijah brought up a point earlier about his friend not being able to find a job. 
One, there are two questions you need to ask any program, and how they answer and what they answer are both very relevant things to ask them. The first is job placement rate, which says X, what percentage of students who graduated last year and the year before found jobs, and that's just found jobs. Second question is what percentage of those jobs were in field? And the reason you really need to ask the second question, so I'll trash state for this one, they're um, biomedical engineering, BME. They claim 90% job placement rate. 50% of those are in field. So that tells you that of the students who graduated, 50% got a job outside the field. Well, that begs the question, why on earth did they not stay in the field? And that's where you need to start asking questions like, well, why didn't they stay in the field? Where do they go? Because no field has 100% placement rate. You look at chemical engineering, my background, okay, 80% go into the field who go on to get a job. Those remaining 20% were probably going for using chemical engineering to get to another place. They were going to get their law degree or their medical degree or some other degree. That's fine. It's more of a problem when you hear things like, well, I got my BME degree so I can go work in textiles. Well, then why don't you just go get a textiles degree because you're more likely to get placed with infield than outside of field. So do ask them those questions. How many students found jobs afterwards and how many found jobs within their fields? And job placement rate is like 60%, but 100% found them within field. That isn't necessarily a bad thing. It means that there's probably gonna be a lot of work you have to do to find a job. But they tell you 60% found jobs and 50% of those were in field. Go get another major, like go figure out what major is more relevant to your actual career path. Oh, and if they don't answer the question, because they're supposed to be keeping the statistics, if they don't answer your question, that should be a big red flag for you. If they get dodgy when you ask the question, that should be a big red flag about the program. So about the Le Chatelier's lab, um, that was due last week. So if you don't see the link for Le Chatelier's, it's because that assignment has already closed out. You were supposed to submit it already. Um, I think the lab for this current week was ethics. If you did Monday and you didn't have anything for Wednesday, because technically you were off, you were supposed to be off that day anyway. This week link will this week will be the GA lab. So with all labs, you have one week from the start of your lab to the start of your lab the following week to complete the assignment and submit it online. If you have not submitted by then, you receive a zero for the assignment. Um, the odds of it being completely online, we have been told to expect it to be, but it's a big question of how the summer plays out. Now, Wake Tech, the management up top is actually doing a very good job. We are waiting to hear back from the state as to when they think it will be safe to go back to work. They're probably gonna to try to play it safe and say we're gonna do online this fall, not because we need to do online, but because we're not gonna know soon enough if we should be online or not. We know you need to register for fall courses. We know a lot of you need to work out your financial aid and things like that. So what we were supposed to do last week was release the fall courses and they're not even up yet. So again, we're probably gonna be online just to play it safe. If we knew for sure that Wake County and North, Ca North Carolina were going to open up by August, they would open up the um, seated classes in the fall. But because they don't know, and they're probably not going to know until June or July, they don't want to yank you around, probably just going to be online this fall.
Now, for those of you, well, for a lot of you who's taking online organic, we actually have been looking, I've been looking at our online, our take home organic kits. So odds are you will still be doing labs for organic, but it's gonna be like four or five actual physical labs that you do at home with the kits that you order. And then the rest will probably be discussion boards. I sincerely hope we do see the classes this fall because I'm teaching organic too. I've never taught it before. And I've, as I'm realizing with organic one, the lab manual is so horribly written. So this fall for organic one, you'll be using my copy of the lab manual that actually has like directions and explanations as to what you're doing. And for organic two, I want to go ahead and teach that course so I can figure out how to rewrite the organic two lab manual. So it's actually usable. So fingers crossed, we're doing the we're not doing seated well that we're not doing online, but we were warned in our meeting last week, it's a real possibility. So they may just be putting the seated courses online, and if we had to switch to online, basically you no longer have a seated course, but you're still enrolled for that class, which is probably the safer bet. Schedule it like we're seated because it's easier to schedule an online class than it is to schedule a seated a seated class. I should probably also go look at WebAdvisor because I have no idea what I'm teaching this fall. All right, so let's kind of wrap this up. Um, again, these live streams are going to be posted to uh, my YouTube channel so you'll be able to go back and watch these. With the discussion boards, for those of you who are watching these after the facts, please remember the discussion boards are still required for attendance. So you do need to be doing these. They're not meant as esoteric exercises. They're there to make sure you're keeping pace with the material. So I will see you, actually I won't see any of you Monday because you're taking the exam. I will be available via Teams and email during that time period in case you have questions about the exam. After this, I'm in lab. Um, I'll be available via Teams, via email, if you have any questions. All right, so next time I see you will probably be Wednesday of this week. Sorry, yeah, I forgot. It's actually Monday, not Wednesday. So see you on Wednesday.